guide you through the college application process because we know it can be super confusing. And we saw that some of you guys already uh, sent in some questions. So we'll address all of those that you emailed in. And then we'll also um, go ahead and have a Q&A session at the end so that if anything pops up, if you have anything you thought of and didn't email, you can let us know and we can answer. But first, um, let me introduce you guys. Um, let me, um, hopefully you guys can see me and hear me all right. Um, if not, make sure to send me some comments, let me know. Um, all right, so let's get started a little bit. Um, and to answer your questions, um, yeah, we will be sending the webinar out later. So if you have any um, questions that you know you want to be repeated, it will all come up later as well. So everything should um, pop up later for you guys. Um, but first, my name is Lindsay. Um, I'm an online college counselor with moonprep.com. And we are an online college um, counselor system who are here to walk you through every single step of the way. So basically what we do is we walk you guys through every single step of the application process. Um, it doesn't matter if you're applying for a competitive kindergarten or med school, we can make sure that you guys get into that, that program that you want to. Um, personally, I help students create memorable personal statements and I also tutor students to help increase their academic profile to universities. So if you need help with like SAT or um, ACT studying, um, I can help you guys with that. Um, so our team of specialists, like I said, walks you through the entire application process. 92% of our students get into one of their top three schools, and which is one of the highest in the industries. And that's because we've put a lot of thought and effort into the college application process to make sure that we are getting you guys where you need to get to go. Um, and what makes us a little bit unique is we are 100% remote. So we can talk to you guys on nights and weekends and we can get you know on a quick 15 minute phone call. We do it through Skype, through Zoom, all that kind of thing. It's complete flexibility. But first, um, I think you might have heard in the emails that we are also going to give out a discount code for $100 off of our services. So at the end of the phone call, I'll show you where you can go to sign up for a free call with Mark. And you just tell him that you came to this webinar, you can get a consultation call with him and you'll get $100 off any of our packages. So um, I'll show you that all at the end as well. So for now, um, Let's go through some of the questions. And if you have any questions um, as you go along, um, you can send them in in the Q&A section or um, let me know. Um, you can raise your hands and I can unmute you and you can talk or um, you can put them in messages and then I can read them there. So that um, either way, if you think of something as you go along, I can make sure to answer you guys' questions as we go along. But first I'm gonna answer the questions that we were emailed to us. So we had one question that was emailed about, um, what is a safety school for a student with a high GPA, top standardized scores, and um, good AP scores? So this is a really good question because creating a balanced college list is really essential. It's kind of the most important thing to do um, whenever you're trying to decide where to apply to college. And it's something that we've noticed a lot of school, um, a lot of students really, um, really struggle with. And first, how to do create your college list is to split it up into three categories. So you should have your safety school, your match school, and your reach schools. So first, we'll talk about safety. So a safety school is when your academic qualifications are a little bit higher than the average admitted freshman. So like the top 25%. And another important thing to look at is the acceptance rate of the school. The school must also have a reasonable acceptance rate. So this means that the school has an acceptance rate of above 50%. Um, so that's the first one, a safety school. The next kind is a match school. And this is when your academic qualifications are similar to the average admitted freshman. So like the middle 50%. Now, a match school will typically have an acceptance rate of 40% of above. Um, if the acceptance rate is a little bit lower than that, it can start to become a little bit unpredictable, regardless of how high your scores are um, and anything else like that. 
And the last one is a REACH school. And this is kind of like your dream school that you wish you could get into, but you're not sure if you have a good chance. Your academic qualifications might be a little bit lower, but still within the range than the average admitted freshman. And these schools will often have an acceptance rate of under 35%. So it's important to note here though, that if a school um, have an, has an acceptance rate of in the teens or even the single digits, it's a reach for every single student, no matter who you are. Even if you're in the top 10% with great extracurriculars, great letters of recommendation, if it's got a 5% acceptance rate, a 10% acceptance rate, it's going to be a reach no matter who you are. So that's something to consider is um, schools like Duke, Harvard, University of Chicago, those are highly selective schools. They're gonna be a reach no matter who you are, um, no matter how good your test scores are. And remember, at the end of the day, the college admissions process is often all up to a person or a committee of people, which means that this is often more of an art than a science. And just because you have a high test score doesn't mean you're automatically going to get in. There's a lot of moving pieces like the essay, the letters of recommendation, your extracurriculars, um, what your resume looks like. So it's beyond just those numbers on your transcript. And that's an important thing to remember. Um, you might get it into your REACH school, but rejected by your safety. There's really no way of knowing. And this kind of ties into another question that was emailed to us, which is, what is ED and the difference between that of ED2? So before I kind of get into ED and ED2, I'm going to talk about the different ways you can apply early. So there are several ways to apply early. You have early action, restrictive early action, early decision, and early decision two. So we're gonna start with the early actions. That's early action and restrictive early action. These both are non-binding, which means if you go and you get accepted, that means you don't have to go. You're not required to go. And the difference between um, early action and restrictive early action is how many schools you can apply to. So you can apply to as many early action schools as you want to, and you can also apply to one early decision school. But on the other hand, there are schools like Harvard, and they offer a restrictive early action. And you're only allowed to apply to one restrictive early action school, and you are not allowed to do any ED schools. But you can apply to other schools during your regular decision round. So this can be a little bit confusing, and remember we are going to send you the recording of this, afterwards so you can review it and remember um, what's the difference between early action and restrictive early action because there are quite a few interesting rules to it. Um, so then the next part of applying early is also our early decisions. Um, for early decision in ED2, those decisions are binding. So let's say if you do get in, ED rules dictate that you must accept this spot. So um, Usually when you apply ED, you usually do have a significantly better chance of getting into the school. So this can be a really good thing for you if you really want to go to a certain school, you're 100% committed and it's your dream school and they have ED. Apply ED, your chances can significantly improve. Schools like Duke might have a 5% admission rate during regular decision, but during their early decision rounds, it might go up to like 18 to 19%. So your chances could be significantly higher. Um, oftentimes those ED acceptance rates are three to four times higher than the regular round acceptance rate. So it's kind of a no brainer. If you're fully committed to your ED school, it's recommended that you apply ED just to maximize your odds. Now, the question was about what is ED1 versus ED2? So the difference between early decision and it's kind of lesser known counterpart, ED2, is all about timing. It's the same exact process, both binding, you can only apply to one school, but for ED, the applications are due in November, and the students receive their decisions in December. For ED2, it's often due in January, with the decisions sent out in February. So as you can see, it just allows you to maybe you applied to school in ED1 and you didn't get in, you can have a second chance during early decision two. Um, however, you can't apply to the same school for ED1 and ED2. You have to pick a different school. So that's an important thing to notice. 
Now for ED2, it's a little bit uh, more intense and a little bit more restrictive than our early action. Because if you do get in, you have to, well, you have to go there. The rules dictate that if you get in, you're supposed to withdraw all your other applications. Um, so you are taking a little bit of a risk if you apply ED, if it's not your number one school and maybe you actually want to go somewhere else. Um, because if you get in, you're technically supposed to enroll, unless something comes up like financial reasons. Now, applying ED does have a huge advantage because of the higher acceptance rate. And the reason for this higher rate is because of something called the yield rate. And you might have noticed on college ranking sites like US News and World, they talk about yield rate. It kind of shows how selective a school is. And schools want to be really selective. They want people to think that everyone wants to go there. So they want to have a higher yield rate. So a yield rate just means that the more students are applying and actually enrolling there. And so that's why a lot of schools like to admit people from their ED, because that means that if they apply, they're going to go there if they get admitted. Um, so if you haven't been looking at US News and World, it's a great resource for you to look at college rankings. Colleges know that, and students should be using that to help them in their college decisions. Um, so basically, to help improve your college admissions chances, try to improve that school's yield rate. But remember, you can only apply to one school for ED and one school for ED2. And if you get accepted, you should withdraw all your other acceptance rates. Um, so if you do get accepted, one thing to look at, or when you're thinking about applying ED, one thing to look at is the cost of going there. So some students think that because they have top grades, they have good test scores and good AP scores, that means that they're going to get a good scholarship because that's kind of our dream. Um, but unfortunately, it's really the case that students get a full ride. And so before applying ED, make sure to look at the cost of admission. You can find that online. And this is really important to look at because you might get your hopes up thinking you can attend um, a school and then find out that you only got a smaller scholarship and it really is not financially possible to go to your, your dream school. So you should only apply ED if you're 100% committed to going. So even if you get $0 for that school, like are you willing to do whatever it takes to apply early decision is kind of what it comes down to. Like, will you and your family be able to handle it financially? Um, will you be willing to take out loans? Will you be willing to like settle that financial burden? Is what you have to think before applying to that ED school, even if you get no, no money. And then if you get 5,000, 10,000, $20,000 a year, um, then it's kind of like a cherry on, on top of the cake. You'll get, you get in that little bit of extra money and take a little bit of that financial burden off of you. So to bank on a full scholarship can be super risky, so it's better not to apply early decision because you don't know what kind of financial package you're going to get. Um, and so the last little thing about ED is if you have, if you have, if you're going to apply ED, apply ED1. If you don't get in, then apply ED2. And that way your kind of admission chances are a little bit higher. Now, does anyone have any questions about ED, ED2, early action, restrictive early action? If so, you can raise your hand or, um, oh, I think I see a hand. Let me see. I'm going to allow you to talk, okay? Maybe. I'm not sure if you meant to do that. Maybe not. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. I had a question about early decision. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're applying to any of the BSMD programs, is that even an option? That is an excellent question. Um, so I'll kind of, I actually have an infographic that I made a couple of days ago about this because that is something that is a really big deal is applying early um, because some schools are a little bit different. So let me share my screen with you guys. So let me know if you guys can't see this. Um, 
But BSMD programs, in case everyone's not aware, basically if you apply to a BSMD program, it means that you're applying to an undergraduate and a medical school kind of all in one fell swoop. And as long as you meet certain qualifications, um, you can, or like the minimum qualifications, like your GPA is up, maybe you have to take the MCAT, maybe you don't, that kind of thing, um, you get a guaranteed seat into the medical school that the undergraduate school is is partnered with. So it's a really huge advantage, but it does mean that the programs are super competitive because it is such an advantage. Um, so the time commitment is also a little bit to apply to a BSMD application is a little bit longer um, just because you often have to write an extra essay. Um, you have to fill out sometimes an extra application and the number of seats sometimes are just 20 per school. Um, so and you will tend to apply to more to more schools because of that. Um, applying to a BSMD program is something that we specialize in actually just because it takes years of prep and work um, where students really have to focus in their extracurriculars on you know science or medicine whereas if you're applying to a traditional application you can be a little bit more general a little bit more open and like I said it just a little bit more time intensive and so like you said, you might be wondering if you can, um, you know, up your odds by applying early action. And the answer is you can apply early action to, um, to the school. So it can be a little bit risky. So you can get into the undergraduate program through early decision. But there's no guarantee that you'll get into the BSMD program. So you could have applied, gotten into the undergraduate, but you often don't find out about the BSMD program until way after that early decision comes out, way after that early decision deadline hits, because you have to tell the school earlier than that May 1st deadline. You usually have a couple weeks before um, to confirm that you're going to go to that school. So often it's a huge risk because you don't know if you're going to get into that BSMD program. And there are some special cases where um, if you apply for the school um, or apply for that program and you don't get in, you're automatically not even qualified to put in your application for the school. So there's some like interesting situations with BSMD programs. So the answer is you can apply early decision, but it's a very big risk. Um, and it just kind of depends on who you are. If you're happy to go to a school regardless of whether or not you get into um, the BSMD program, then it's a good way to up your odds of getting into the school. Um, but if you are 100% committed to going to a BSMD program, no matter what, it probably would be better to your advantage to not a use, not apply to early, early decisions, sorry. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. I think I saw someone else's hand go up. I'm gonna stop sharing, because someone let me see. Oh, let's see. Did you have another follow-up question? Mm, no. Okay, it said your hand was still up, so I wasn't sure. Oh, there we go, I can lower it. Okay, let's see, I think we have another question. Let me allow you to talk. Uh, for this past year so far, uh, can you mention some of the schools that uh, you know, candidates have gotten into? Uh, what, for all candidates? And what the, yeah, and what the acceptance rate has been, you know, uh, among the people you helped. Yeah, so um, we're actually right now kind of compiling all that information. Um, so I know that our, some of our students have gone into a lot of BSMD programs, actually. Um, we had one girl that got into three different BSMD programs, but it's kind of hard to say um, um, that for this year, at least what our acceptance rate is, we can email that to you later on. I know that that's something that we're actually compiling this week to figure out where everyone decided to go and everything like that. But we had students who got in all over the country, University of Chicago, um, Emory, um, I'm trying to think where else, kind of all over the place. Um, and for a wide variety of programs, we had a lot of engineering. We had a couple of BSMD students, pre-med students, um, all across the board of students who are interested more in like the artistic side versus the math and science side. So um, a lot of really competitive students this year that got into high places. But we can email you and let you know further a list of where everyone got in this year. 
if, if that's what we're allowed to do. Um, does anyone else have a question? No? Okay, well then I'll keep going back um, to, I'm gonna say one more thing about BSMD programs actually. Let me um, share my screen one more time and then talk about actually the interview process for BSMD programs. And um, so BSMD programs are actually a little bit different than the traditional process. So they will almost always be on campus. You might have an initial phone screening um, via Skype or on the phone, but then a lot of the times they'll bring in candidates um, onto the campus for an interview. And this type of interview will follow an MMI format, which is almost like a series of mini interviews. You might have six or seven um, different scenarios where you talk with one um, interview. And the good thing about this is um, the students aren't, if you know, you maybe don't answer one question exactly how you'd want to, it won't destroy completely your entire interview process. Um, but it is a little bit, um, more intensive. So um, you often are on campus and then you get to see exactly where and then they could get to meet your personality. But for a traditional, it's more via phone or through an alum at a coffee shop or that kind of thing. So it's a little bit different. So that's kind of another way that BSMD and traditional applications um, differ. All right, let's see if we have another question. Let's go back. Let's see, I just unmuted you, I think. Yes, I had a question about Emory. You just mentioned Emory, but do they have the BSMD program or is it just for like a pre-med? Just for pre-med, yeah. We had a pre-med student who, actually I don't even think she was pre-med, she was um, South um, East Asian Studies. So it's kind of all over the place, even though they have such a um, competitive engineering program there. Um, or is it engineering? Now I'm not thinking of the right one, but they, she got in with that. So it kind of is all over the board with our students, but Emory does not have a BSMD program. And then I see someone typed in a question about the timelines for ED, ED2, EA, and restrictive EA. So for ED, um, this one is typically, um, for ED, it's typically in December, and then you'll find out in January. And then that gives you a little bit of leeway um, for finding out about if you can apply to ED2. So ED2 will typically be a couple of weeks later, and that will be um, in January. And then you find out in, let me make sure, because there is a lot going on here. Um, so ED2 is due in January with the decision sent out in February. And then EA, it can kind of, um, it can kind of differ, but for EA, it will often be in November or December, and then you'll find out in the new year as well. So that gives you a really good chance of knowing before a lot of other students even have started to apply to schools, um, if you're going to get in or not. So can, if you apply early action, ED, ED2, or restrictive, um, early action, it can give you a chance to kind of regroup if you don't get into the schools that you want. And then we had one more question about um, if we help children or help the students write the essay in the common application. And the answer is absolutely yes. So that's one of the things that Moon Prep definitely um, focuses on is the essay writing because we realized that you know a lot of students have amazing extracurriculars, amazing um, test scores and SAT scores and everything like that. So like the one way to really stand out is um, is through your essays, and we really focus on like a narrative storytelling. So we work. You know, often we'll start now with our rising or our rising seniors, and we'll work with them now, starting writing their Common App essay because those Common App essays are actually already open. And so, if you start now, you can write your Common App essay. Um, you can brainstorm. You can write your drafts with us. You can, you know, finish your edits. Um, 
And this can take a lot of pressure off. So we really stress working on the Common App over the summer and even into the fall with our students. Um, but yeah, that's something that we really do specialize in because we know that's the way that students can, you know, become a real person off the page instead of just numbers um, to the admissions counselors. Um, this is the way that they can share their story, make it unique, and share a unique perspective. So we we that's something that we would recommend working with a counselor because we kind of understand how to tell that story um, a little bit better and how to get you what you want on the screen. Um, and then we're going to go back to EA. So we have one more EA question. If we get EA, do we need to take it or can we wait till May? So that's the good thing about early action is you can wait. Um, for ED, you are required to tell them usually within a couple of weeks, they'll set a deadline, um, you know, that you will send in your deposit. But for early action, you can sit on it until May 1st, until decision day. Um, that's kind of the advantage. So you'll know a little bit sooner and you don't have to, to rush into any decision. Um, the disadvantage of EA is there's sometimes not a, like a statistical improvement versus the other ones. Um, EA is kind of just like helps you figure out sooner if you got in or not. So it can, you know, save you some time and effort and money with applications, but you might not have a better chance of getting in. So that's why we kind of recommend ED and ED2 over EA um, if you're 100% committed, because EA, you can wait until May 1st to make your decision, but that means that maybe the college isn't as committed to you as well. And then we have one more question about what's the usual average number of colleges to apply to? So that's a great question. Um, I'm gonna go back to this infographic here. So it kind of depends on a lot of moving pieces. So if you are really committed to staying in state, five or six colleges like might be enough. For example, if you do live in Georgia, they offer some really great scholarship opportunities like the Hope and Zeller Miller Scholarship. And that could be enough for you if you qualify for that based on your merit, um, that it could give you, you know, maybe a full ride or, you know, partial scholarships. So these kind of things can be really helpful to in-state students. So some states will offer that. So that's why it might be to your benefit to stay in-state. And so you might not be looking around for as many colleges. So five to six might be enough. You want a couple safeties, a couple reaches, and a couple matches. Um, but it kind of depends on your goals and where you want to go. If you want to go out of state, you might want to apply to 12 to 15, both in state and out of state. And once again, kind of splitting up your list between safeties, reaches, and matches. Um, so a lot of our students who are doing the traditional um, applications, they'll apply, you know, to 10 to 15, you know, it might vary. Whereas if you're applying to um, a BSMD program, because it's so competitive, you will have to apply to more schools just because some of those places have acceptance rates in the low, low, you know, 5%. They only have 20 spots. They had good you know, 100 applications, hundreds of applications, it really is to your advantage to apply to more places if you're like committed to a BSMD program. And the same is kind of true for if you are looking to go to an Ivy League school. So a lot of those schools also have extremely low acceptance rates. That means every single college is going to be a reach on your list um, if it's an Ivy League. So you want to apply to more of them to kind of improve your chances of at least getting into um, to one that you do want to go to. And then of course you want to balance out your list with some matches and some safety schools as well to ensure that you are going somewhere. So the answer is um, it kind of depends on what your, where you want to apply. If you want to stay in-state, out-state, BSMD programs are like Ivy Leagues, really highly selective colleges, you'll have to apply more. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen real quick. Oops. Let's see, I think that's all we have for right now. Um, so I'm gonna keep going back to our email questions. Um, so we had a question about, will my chosen major affect my chance of acceptance? So 
a lot of times you can declare what you want to major in when you're on your application. So some counselors will say, um, you know, it doesn't really matter. But at Moon Prep, we say that 100% it does matter. Um, we see this a lot with our top students. Like, for example, um, if everyone at Georgia Tech is applying for engineering, um, it might help you to apply for like a more obscure major. Um, so for example, at Georgia Tech, mechanical engineering is the most popular major. And the second most popular one is business. And not everyone can major in those two things. So of course, um, choosing a less popular major might help you. But this is a really important you know, qualification. You should not lie. Um, you don't want your, your activities, your classes, they have to support your major choice. So if everything you've done so far is science-based, um, it doesn't make sense if your major doesn't reflect it. Like if you choose South Asian studies, if everything you've done is science Olympiad, AP physics, AP um, biology, like it just doesn't quite add up. So the admissions um, committee might see that and it might have a red flag for them. So make sure that your major is something you're actually interested in and you're not lying on your application just because you think it might improve your application success. But think about it this way. If you think you might like engineering or, some, or science, maybe you pick physics as your major versus engineering. Because like a woman studying physics at Georgia Tech might stand a better chance of admission than a woman studying mechanical engineering because there just aren't as many women studying physics. So it's also important to remember what you choose on your application does not affect, you know, does not lock you into that degree forever. You can change it and most students do change it two to three times. Um, you can consider your major, the de declaration of your major as part of a strategy. Um, especially if you don't know for sure what you want to do in the future. So if you're on the fence, look at what the popular majors are at the school that you want to attend. Um, and that can kind of help you choose what you might declare as your major. And if you're on the fence with your major, um, then you can do a little bit of research. But um, you should not lie. That's the most important thing. Lying is never the right idea. All right, so we see a couple more questions here. Now, please explain the difference between different applications, so the Common App or the Coalition. Okay, so this is a really great question. So different schools might use the Common App versus the Coalition, and you might find um, that the essays that are required for both the Common App and the Coalition App are very similar. Um, the only difference often is the word count. So for the Common App, I believe it's 650 words versus the Coalition App, which I think is 750 words. A lot of the times the prompts will be very similar. It just depends on which one the school is using. And a lot of the times the school will say you can apply either via the Common App or the Coalition App. Um, so uh, it just kind of, it won't give you an advantage either way. It just depends on which one you are, you are more interested in doing. So maybe a lot of your schools are through the Common App, and so that's what you choose to do it through. Or if a lot of your schools use the Coalition App more heavily, then that's, that's the one you could use. It really doesn't matter which one you use. It's pretty much um, a similar platform, just different, just, it's just a little bit different. Um, so a lot of my students use the Common App over the Coalition App, but if you choose to use the Coalition App when you have the option, it's not gonna hurt your chances. Um, and then it's important to note if you do wanna go to some schools um, like in California or in Texas, they have a whole different system. Neither of them are, you can apply through the Common App or the Coalition App. Um, so if you are having trouble um, finding your schools there, that's probably because they're in that section. Um, let's see, and then we have another one. So do financial aid decisions follow offers of admission closely or might they come after the required acceptance of an ED offer of admissions? So um, you'll find out what the financial aid offer is once you get accepted. So the financial aid decision, once you get accepted, you'll know that this is what 
how much money you'll get as soon as you get accepted. But that can be kind of risky because if you are accepted through ED, um, you are requ required to, um, to accept. But since you don't know how much money you're gonna get, it can be a little bit risky. And that kind of is one of the ways you can get out of um, ED. So ED, um, a school isn't going to want to force you to go if you don't want to. So if you do, um, if you do get in and the financial offer is just too low, um, the one way you can get out is like due to the financial aid. So it, it can be risky though, because you're turning down an acceptance to one of your top schools, um, to your ED school, because at this point, it's probably January, maybe February. You don't know where else you're going to get into. You don't know how much scholarship money you're going to get from other schools. Um, so it's hard to, you know, be for certain if you should turn down this ED offer. Um, so that's why I would kind of suggest if you're applying ED, only do it if you're like pretty certain that you can handle that money or handle paying for it regardless of your scholarship situation. Like you have to be willing to take out those loans or just like shoulder that financial burden between you and your family. So it can be a little bit of a risk to turn down that ED for the, for the chance of maybe getting into some equal, equal level school. So that's kind of something we suggest to students is to like really think about the cost of going there before applying ED. Don't just apply because your chances might be better think through the financial burden, the financial aid situation, what happens if you don't get anything. So it's kind of one of the, the risky businesses. Um, it is important to note that only 5%, well, we read, we read that only 5% of students do back out of ED. So it's really rare that it happens. Um, and a lot of the times you can, you know, talk to the school and ask them, for help financially if a situation has changed. So there are ways you can get around it. Um, but yeah, once you apply ED, you'll usually know right away how much money you got and they can make a decision from there. Okay, and then here's another question that just came in. Um, but how would a typical BSMD extracurricular GPA scores look like? So yes. Um, all of our successful BSMD candidates, they have just top scores. Usually they're ranked very high in their classes. Um, and a lot of them have really um, competitive, um, like medical research experience. Maybe they've been published, um, they've volunteered in hospitals, they've shadowed physicians. Um, because for a BSMD program, you have to prove that you, um, um, you have to prove that you are, you know, really committed to medicine. And this way, you have to have shown it for the past couple of years. Because if you are accepted to a BSMD program, it's kind of the same as ED. You're kind of locked into this career path. Um, for the next seven or eight years, you're going to be at that undergraduate school and then that medical school. You know what the next years are going to look like. Um, so this can be a really big commitment. And because of that, the BSMD programs want to see that you're committed. And that's why a lot of the students we work with are actually in eighth or ninth grade. Um, it's like not too early to start um, because for these really competitive programs for Ivy Leagues and for BSMDs, um, it takes you know years of building up your resume to make sure that you can get in. So um, a lot of our students, um, have applied for like competitive summer camp programs. So for example, um, different schools will offer sophomores or juniors a chance to go and do medical research. Um, for example, like Texas Tech, I talked to the dean of that school um, about their program and a lot of their students get a hands-on opportunity to work in you know a science-based field maybe it's medical research maybe it's um, something else related to it and a lot of these students get really great experience they make really great connections but these programs um, like the Texas Tech one um, are super competitive like maybe just like a competitive college, a highly selective college. So if you are serious about being a BSMD program, you should consider looking into like summer camp programs like this to help you get that, um, to get that like medical research experience. So 
the problem is um, you also need to take advantage of your summers. And even though it's only May and summer really hasn't even started yet, a lot of these um, a lot of these summer camps, a lot of medical volunteer programs, a lot of maybe not doctor shadowing, but a lot of like any experience research opportunities um, have already kind of passed you by for the summer, even though summer hasn't even started. Um, so a lot of those competitive programs that I was talking about, they close their applications in January, February, and March. It's just like applying to college. Those applications have already, you know, been closed for months and the decisions have already been sent out. Um, so if you're like just now starting to think about your summer plans and you want to be competitive for these BSMD programs, it is almost a little bit too late now for this summer um, for the best opportunities. Um, Cause even like volunteer positions close their applications um, a couple months ago, which you know, kind of seems crazy that even a volunteer position was closed. Um, but that's why we start working with our students in eighth and ninth grade. So we can map out their summers um, to make sure that they're using them, you know, to their advantage. They're getting their research experience and they're volunteering. They're getting, you know, hands-on medical experience, especially for those BSMD programs. Um, just because you really do have to put a lot of planning and you have to be, you know, the best of the best if you do want to be in a BSMD program. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard to say also versus grades. Um, it's a lot of, you know, the essay writing and how you do in the interviews are also judged. So you have to have really good grades. You have to be the complete package, basically. It's not easy to get into these BSMD programs, but it is you know, possible. Um, but your, you know, letters of recommendation have to be great. Your essays has to be great. Um, the, your extracurriculars should all be very focused on science and medicine is kind of the best way um, to prepare for that kind of rigorous program. All right. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, so we have this one. Does being a woman really help in getting admission to engineering branch, which is computer science? Oh, for this one, it's hard to say because I think that a lot of the times admissions counselors, they can never admit it. It's kind of the same thing, um, you know, the diversity blindness, but I think it is something that they might look at and it is something that they can consider. So if that is something that you're truly interested in, if you are, you know, looking into getting into computer science, a lot of these programs are looking to bolster it up with more women. And while they will never admit it, it could help your admissions chances, and it definitely won't hurt, especially if you are just as qualified. So it definitely won't hurt you, but it could help you if you are a woman wanting to get into an engineering branch, which is computer science. Let's see. Okay. So we have one more question about what should... Um, your student resume look like if you don't have a lot of like extracurricular things to put on there. So maybe you are a, you know, a rising senior and you're starting to realize that, you know, you haven't been in many clubs, um, you haven't been in many extracurricular things, but it's okay because, you know, there is things that you could do to put on your resume to talk about in your comment application. Um, let me share my screen one more time with you guys to kind of show you what we do at Moon Prep um, to help you guys through the process. So um, it's not required for students to fill out a resume, um, but at Moon Prep that we really encourage our students to fill out a resume because um, we think that it really does help our students because um, it's another way for you to come alive. You know, you only have 650 words for the Common App and maybe a couple of other, um, a couple of other, um, oh, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, you maybe a couple other supplemental essays, um, but, you know, this resume is a chance to link to your Common App and to show, you know, your skills and your talents and maybe some amazing thing that you've done that you just didn't have time to talk about in your Common App because it, there just isn't enough room sometimes. Um, so we work with you um, on your resume. And even if you don't have, you know, amazing um, extracurriculars, in your opinion, I'm sure that, you know, we can help you find and plan and figure out a way to add a little bit more extracurriculars. Um, so having this resume can be really helpful to you um, because even if you're, you do use it for applying to colleges, um, 
You can also use it for competitive summer camps, for you know internships, for volunteer positions. Having a resume is a really helpful thing, and it's actually something that you could be working on during the summer, because you know, before your senior year gets crazy or even your junior year gets crazy, um, it's just kind of nice to have your resume on your back burner already completed so you don't have to worry about it. So this is kind of an example of a template that we could do with our students. Um, we put down their academics, we highlight their experience and their objective. It's just another way um, to help that student come to life on the page. And we actually recommend our students also do um, LinkedIn, um, uh, because LinkedIn is a way that you can do some pictures, some video, maybe you play the violin, you can have a concert, um, maybe you have a video of you at a concert, or you do dance, you can have a video of a recital. Um, if you've done, you know, service projects or a research paper, you can add that to your LinkedIn, and that's another way to kind of showcase. So maybe the admissions um, officers, if they're not, you know, if they need more information about you, if they're kind of on the fence about you, your LinkedIn can kind of give them the extra, you know, push to see that you're a real human and, you know, the amazing things that you've done. So that's why um, having that resume, having the LinkedIn isn't really required, but it can help you give you that like little extra bit in like a really competitive field. And that's why we really do stress um, starting early. Um, so, um, we, we think that if you start in your summer, you can kind of relieve that stress. So you can get that Common App essay out of the way. You might not know about the supplemental essays from the schools, but the Common Application, they've already announced that the essays are going to be the same. And um, the Coalition essay also opens up in the summer and the Applied Texas one also opens up July 1st. So you can get a lot of that work out of the way before your crazy senior year between sports, AP tests, AP exams, everything going on with school. It's a great way um, to kind of wrap everything up before your senior year starts and really can alleviate a lot of stress. Okay, it looks like we... So, oh, here we go. We got a couple more questions here. Um, so we have a question about how important is taking physics in high school? Um, it just depends on what your career goal is. Um, if you don't have any desire to learn physics in college, then you don't need to take it in, in high school. Um, it's not gonna help you or hurt you. Um, and if you're thinking about taking AP physics, um, we actually recommend that you kind of tailor your AP exams more to the ones that have interest in you. Um, it's better to, you know, not take all of your AP exams um, than to, you know, take them. So it just kind of depends on, on what, your, what your needs are and everything like that. Um, and then I see the next one is, I'm having trouble starting my personal statement. So any tips on ways to open it? So this is like something that our students really struggle with a lot. And so a lot of our work with our students is thinking about like what story you have to tell, um, like what makes you so unique, what makes your perspective so unique. Um, because any student can talk about, you know, their normal everyday to life. They can talk about how much they love Harry Potter or that they play football or they play soccer. You know, it's like all those kind of things that don't make you unique. But finding that story, um, maybe it's a story where, you know, you had a really tough situation and you learn from it or, you know, um, your hero and why that person has affected your life. Kind of a growth story as well um, can be a great one. Um, you wanna make it all about you. So if you do talk about like, you know, someone else in your essay, maybe your mom, you want to make sure that you bring it back to yourself more than, you know, talking about someone else. Um, but we really do stress the narrative form. So for that personal statement, you might go through a couple of, um, a couple of drafts before you kind of come up with your great idea. Um, but try and think of that narrative, um, 
that story that makes you who you are. Um, you can like, you know, kind of try and talk it through, see what kind of makes you different from anyone else there. Um, and what kind of showcases your skills the most too. Um, it can really vary though, depending on which of the common apps you, you know, decide. Um, there's a lot of different options for you there. Okay. So our next one is, let's see, what age is going to affect your acceptance into medical school? Um, so age, the problem is, you know, you have to take the MCAT again. And so a lot of older um, people who have been out of school for a couple of years might be intimidated by taking, you know, the GMAT or the MCAT. But your age isn't going to affect you so much. It's all about your perspective and your willingness to put in the work to apply to those programs. Um, there's a lot of, you know, untraditional students who still go and they still succeed and get into medical school. So age isn't so much a factor. Um, of course, it doesn't happen as often an older medical student just because it does, you know, consume your life. So you have to be prepared for it to consume your life and be ready for that. But age doesn't affect so much. Um, let's see. And let's see, this question is competitive universities strive to recruit students from um, most if not all states. How can a student find out whether or not their home state is underrepresented in specific universities? So Florida does not have many students go out of state. So a lot of the times um, schools will put on, um, put on their websites where their students come from. Um, and you can find that a lot of the times online um, just by Googling where those students come from. Um, but that's a really interesting question and I'm not sure how else they could find. So but I can get back to you, John, and find out um, how a student can find out whether or not their home state is underrepresented in specific universities. So I'll make a note of that and make sure that we email that answer out because I'm not, not super sure about that one. Um, let's see. And we have another question um, about how many colleges require two letters of recommendation from teachers or counselors. Um, does adding more recommendations would provide an edge or annoy the admissions counselor? So that's a really good question. Um, a lot of the times they won't even allow you to put in more um, or they won't even read them. So if you just send in two, that should be sufficient um, because they might not even look at those extra ones um, and um, so sending in those two is usually sufficient um, a lot of the times there will be an email link that you send out to the people and it won't allow you to send out the email link to more than those two people um, and it's just kind of to help them reduce their workload so um, a, a letter of recommendation, we recommend just the one of the two is probably sufficient. Um, and making sure when you're asking someone for a letter of recommendation to, you know, pick someone who really does know you, has maybe seen you grow as a student, as a person for the last couple of years, maybe someone who's your mentor, um, and, you know, can really write a solid recommendation. And those two letters of recommendations should be like totally sufficient to those colleges that will probably, um, won't help you to send in more. So two is good. Um, let's see. I have one question about that. If you have an MCAT score with a degree, um, do you still require to take all bio, organic, and inorganic classes? Really good question, and I'm also not sure about the answer for the MCAT. Um, I would think that as long as you look on individual medical school programs, um, and the met or you know requirements that they have as long as you're meeting those minimum requirements that should probably be sufficient um, and the as long as you hit those requirements it doesn't matter if you take extra as long as you do the minimum but i'm also not positive about that so we will email you that answer as well in case i'm wrong and then i think we're going to hit one more question and then our hour will be about up. So then this will be our last question. And if you have any more, um, 
we can also do another webinar. We can email your um, answers out and that kind of thing. We're here to definitely help you. Um, so I'll, actually, I have two more questions and then, <laughs> and then we'll be done. So um, for top schools, do you really have to be a straight A student for acceptance? Like three to four Bs over your high school career um, is really not that bad. And you're completely right. Three to four Bs over your high school career is, you know, not going to make or break your, um, your, you know, acceptance into some of these schools. Um, it just kind of depends on, you know, the whole package is they're not going to just look at those couple of things and it's going to immediately disqualify you. It also depends on your SAT scores, your ACT scores, um, you know, your extracurriculars, your essay writings, um, your letters of recommendation. So like, just because you have maybe a little bit lower of a GPA, it's not going to immediately cut you out of the running. So that's an important thing to understand is it's a holistic like looking at you. It's a whole package. Um, and, you know, maybe you have a couple low B's because you went through like a traumatic time in your life and you can explain that to the admissions officers as well. Um, so as long as you can like maybe if you got lower than a couple B's or you had like, you know, a bad semester, there's a time where you can, you know, talk to the admissions counselors in your um, additional information section in your common app and kind of explain the grades. But three to four B's over your high school is, you're completely right. It's not bad at all. So um, it's not going to make or break your admission success. Remember, it's the whole package. There's a lot of moving pieces here. Um, so that's an important thing to consider. Okay, we got one more question. If we get accepted in early action, do we need to take it or do we have other options um, unlike ED? So that's a really good question. So if you do get accepted um, early action, you are allowed to apply to um, other schools during um, uh, during regular decision. You can even apply, if you apply early action, you can even apply to a school early decision. So um, it just depends on if you get accepted in that ED, you have to withdraw all the other applications. But for EA, you can apply um, to as many EA schools as you want even. Um, so EA is very, if it's, you know, the regular EA, it's very open. You can apply to as many early actions as you want and even one ED school. It's the restrictive early actions that's more restrictive. You can only apply to that one EA um, restrictive early action school, and you cannot do any um, early decision. But for restrictive early action, you can still apply during the regular decision round because that one's a little bit more open. Okay, so um, our hour is already about up. And if you guys have any more questions, um, we're going to do more webinars. You can email us as well any of your questions. And you can also sign up for a free um, consultation with our CEO, Mark. Um, and because we always offer a free call, but because you guys came to this webinar, we wanted to kind of reward you guys. Um, once you um, talk with Mark, we'll do a, um, we have a little discount, a little price for you guys. You get $100 off any um, of our packages. So make sure to just mention on your call with Mark um, that, that you attended this webinar and he'll make sure to take care of that all for you if you do decide to work with um, our Moon Prep team. And to find this page, just go to our website. It's um, www.moonprep.com slash contact. And then you can pick um, any time you really want. Um, so if you um, have any questions, um, please just let us know. Um, so here's, you know, a little reminder, just attend this webinar, $100 off any package. Um, and if you have any other questions, let us know. And I want to thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, it was really fun talking to you guys and you guys asked really great questions. So it's really good to hear, you know, what is confusing about this college application process to everyone. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you guys next time. It was really fun. So I'll see you guys later, guys. All right. Bye, everyone. See you guys next time.